lockdown and it's been five years since the church was allowed to go door to door to raise money for Adra. So now I have to look at different ways of raising money. Well what does the work, what does Adra do you ask yourself, what do they do? Well they respond to disasters, we've had several disasters in the last 12 months haven't we? They also have uh, work with farmers in Nepal, Zambia and India. They're improving the livelihoods of people in the, uh, uh, the Mauritanian lepers. They're improving the tea estate workers of people in Sri Lanka. They're giving support to those suffering from COVID in Ghana. They're improving women's health and immunisation in Nepal. They're strengthening migrant rights in Thailand. And they're an advocate for women's rights in different countries of the world. This is what ADRA are proposing to do in 2024. So what can we do to help them? Well, our pastor has got a walk, hasn't he? He's going to do a walk in a couple of months' time. Alvin did it last year, 22 miles along the canal, and uh, he, uh, he uh, does it in eight hours. Now, a few years ago, I could have done it, <laughs> but sad to say, I cannot do 22 miles in eight hours any longer. That's beyond my uh, abilities at the moment. So what can we do as a church? I'm proposing that we have a walk in the Samuel Valley on a Sunday. And you can all be sponsored by your friends and relatives, and that will raise money for ADRA. That's what I'm proposing. Sometime uh, uh, before the end of the summer term, that's in the school holidays, on a Sunday, after the children have finished their exams. So I want to show you three little clips now about ADRA, about the work that they're doing. There's three different people who work for ADRA are uh, talking about what they do with their work for ADRA. You know, ADRA doesn't take a lot of... If you give a donation to ADRA, you can be sure that 90% of the money that you give will go to the work, actual work that ADRA is doing. You can't always be sure of that with all charities. But you can be 100% sure of that. If ADRA is doing work uh, overseas, they, they, get, uh, they put down 10% of the money and they get 10% given to them by government because government knows that the work that ADRA does, the money is going right to the people who need it. If they give that money to the, uh, it's to the, uh, um, the powers that be, if they give it to the, 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 the towns and the cities, a lot of that money will go into other people's pockets. But they know if they put money in through ADRA, it will go to the people in need. So are we ready with our first one? This lady is 
this lady is um, uh, the, she's the interim um, organiser of ADRA. She's been doing this job for about uh, six or seven months now. A Call to Compassion. It is based on the passage from Matthew chapter 9, verses 36 and 38. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they were faint and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Jesus was moved with compassion. Jesus felt the suffering and the pain of the numerous people that followed him. And today, Jesus feels that hurt and anguish for the vulnerable in our world. In the middle of the war in Gaza, Jesus is moved with compassion. In the Ukraine conflict, he is pained. In the midst of famine and starvation, environmental disasters and man-made tragedies, our Lord is not only moved with compassion, but he weeps. And some people ask, where is God in the middle of tragedies? Well, God sends human agents to feed the hungry, to give water to the thirsty, to heal the brokenhearted and provide aid in emergencies. Other offices around the world are the hands and the feet of Jesus. Their daily walk is to support the most vulnerable and continually lending a helping hand to those who suffer. Give now. We can't do it without you. Your support makes our work possible. Your generous gift now will have a direct and life-saving impact worldwide. So to donate, click on the link in the bio, scan the QR code, or visit adra.org.uk backslash donate. This year, we want to raise £250,000. Yes, you heard right, a quarter of a million pounds. How will the funds be used? Funds raised during our Call to Compassion campaign will support dairy farmers in Nepal, Zambia and India, improve livelihoods and provide shelter for Mauritanian lepers, improve nutrition for Tia State workers in rural communities in Sri Lanka. They will also improve women's health outcomes and immunization in Nepal and strengthen migrant rights protection in Thailand. Advocacy for women's rights both in the UK and developing countries will also benefit from these funds. And we are pleased to announce that once again, up to 10% of funds raised will go to supporting high impact projects right here in the UK. Give now. We can't do it. My office overlooks a beautiful park full of vibrant colors. Having a passion for the environment, I enjoy and indulge in the blessings and benefits of the natural world. Being able to enjoy God's creation truly is a privilege. But I am saddened that humanity, God's greatest creation, is suffering in so many parts of the world. The current cholera outbreak in Zambia, the ongoing conflict in Ukraine, the war in Gaza. These are just a few of the crises that affect our world. At Adra UK, our mission is to serve humanity so that all may live as God intended. Give now. We can't do it without you. Your support makes our work possible. Your generous gift now will have a direct and life-saving impact worldwide. So to donate, click on the link in the bio, scan the QR code, or visit adra.org.uk backslash donate. So that's what Adra is doing this year. Uh, you'll hear more about what we can do to help Adra as the year goes by. Uh, when Pastor Obi does his walk, and we do our walk um, later on in the year. Uh, you can give to Adra through your, uh, through your offerings envelope. There's a slot there if you want to give individually to Adra. You just have to put the amount down against Adra and the money goes by the North England Conference to Adra. Um, you can also uh, give directly to ADRA and gift aid your money 
that's another way of doing it. So if you gift aid it, that means that the amount of money you give is increased by 25%. If you give to the church, if you give through the church, it gets gift aided uh, through the North England Treasury Department. So God bless you as you contribute to Agra. And we'll give you more information as time goes by. Thank you. Okay. We are going to continue with singing. Um, what a day, a glorious day.
Happy Sabbath Church. Just having some important announcements. You know, we had a board board meeting, church board meeting, very recently, and we have nominated Elder Alvin for conference session delegate to represent Second Coldfield Church. This is going to happen between September 11th to 14th. It is basically, we will send somebody from Sakun Coldfield Church for conference session delegate meeting. All the delegates from different, different church, they will represent one person to send for the session. This is going to happen in September 11th to 14th. We don't know when it's going to, I mean, where it's going to take place, but it's a NEC delegate session. So, is there anybody to second this, please? This decision. May I know all those are favor to show your right hand that Alvin can be sent. <coughs> is there any sign of opposition? It's carried now, so this will be the first reading. We're going to read the second reading next week as well. So he'll be representing our Sakun Goldfield Church in the session of the <coughs> meeting, that is number one. And today afternoon, after our uh, potluck lunch, personal ministries have planned for street evangelism. We're going to distribute blue tracks and we have some copies. Like says VG White's writing, we have some uh, health books. We're going to distribute that. That's going to take place at 3 p.m. at Sutton Coldfield Town Center. So right after our uh, potluck lunch, we're coming back here. We'll just have a prayer. Then we'll go to the streets. I request everybody, all the children, and all the members to stay behind. And please participate in the street evangelism. And for our uh, communion service, we have actually planned for next week. But some of our friends, they are going to Manchester for Ace Fellowship. So we have postponed that communion service to first week of April, which is on 6th. We're going to have our communion service. So please pray for this service. And let's all continue to work with oneness and uh, help each other in the church activities. Thank you. I want to invite you. This is not selling uh, like last time, last week. Uh, we are going for a camp, which is Savadaran camp, on from the 4th to 8th, which is a holiday for children. We are short of people. We are only 31 people. We can accord, accommodate around 50 people. If you want to join us, it's four day camp. It's very cheap. Okay. If you want to join us, please do see me. Uh, we have place. Uh, we are going to have some good time, four days in our land. Okay. We are going to sing this song, March of the Tempest is Raging. I don't know whether we got it in the computer there. Sorry, it's uh, CIS uh, 268. If somebody can send, uh, probably send it to the church group, probably you can sing that song. It's not there. Okay. Okay. Shall we choose something which we know from him? Okay. Any other choice? Four, five, six. Okay, four, five, six. <coughs> Sister, I want you to sing with me. Four, five, six. I have friends so precious. <coughs> Oh, 
here already. Shall we stand and sing 495? 495. sanctuary we invite father to be with us we invite the holy spirit to come and fill this place we invite jesus christ to sit by us in jesus name i pray Amen. good morning everyone and happy sabbath happy, happy sabbath, sabbath. I would like to read a small passage from the Bible. Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, and for his mercy endureth forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, whom he hath redeemed from the land of the enemy, and gathered them out of the land from the east and from the west, from the north and from the south. With this thought, I would like to welcome each and every one of you on this Sabbath morning. I'm sure. Many of us seated here would have had a hectic week, but we are so thankful and grateful to God that he's been so merciful, he's protected us throughout the week, and he's brought us safely to his house to worship him. And I pray that the Holy Spirit fill us at this hour, <coughs> this divine hour, as we worship him together. For our opening song, let's all rise and sing hymn number 223. Hymn number 223.
Good morning and a very happy Sabbath, everyone. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is taken from Matthew 13, verse 14 and 15. And in them, the provisions of the of Isaiah is fulfilled in saying, Hearing me will hear and shall not understand and seeing you will see and not perceive for the hearts of the people have grown dull their ears are hard of hearing and their eyes they have closed lest they shall see with their eyes and here with their ears, lest they should understand with their hearts and turn, so that I should heal them. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Shall we all kneel down and seek the Lord in prayer? <coughs> Our most gracious Heavenly Father in Heaven, Lord, we are so thankful to you, Heavenly Father, for this beautiful Sabbath day and this divine hour that you have given to us where we could come before your feet and worship you together as a church family, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with us throughout this week, for watching over us, for taking care of us and all our needs, Father. We humble ourselves before your feet, Lord, at this hour. We know our <coughs> sinful nature. We know how wicked we are, Father. We humble ourselves before your feet, asking you to forgive us out of all our sins and shortcomings, Lord. We pray that if there's any sin in us that stands as a hindrance from you hearing our prayers, we humbly pray that you would forgive us and cleanse us out of all our unrighteousness, Father. Lord Jesus, at this time, I pray for the ones who are not able to come to church today. Whatever their problems and difficulties are, may you be with them and take care of them, Father. I also pray, Heavenly Father, for the speaker of this hour, touch his lips, Father, so that we may hear today what you want us to hear, Father. Lord Jesus, be with each and every one of us as we bow down our heads before you, Lord. And may your Holy Spirit fill our hearts and let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, Father, throughout this hour of worship. Be with us, Father, until the end. In Jesus' holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. It's time for the church bill offering to be collected. I invite all those who have the church build offering, church building offering to come forward and place it in the little um, church that we have here, post which I request the deacons to come forward and collect the tithe and offering. Okay, we are going to sing building of the temple and then we are going to sing 109, 109 after that. Oh, 
9, 109, grace, grace, God's grace. Everybody join it together, please. And we will have the children's story by Tina. Everybody. Um, today I'm going to tell a story about a ship which sailed in the Atlantic Ocean. Um, once upon a time there was a small ship um, in the Atlantic Ocean and a storm was taking place. The ship was capsi capsizing. Um, who knows what capsizing means? Yeah, capsizing means when a ship um, is filled with water and it drowns. Um, so the sailors in the ship tried pumping out the water so the ship would stay afloat, but it was to no avail. It was sinking fast. So um, they turned their hope to the lifeboats. A lifeboat um, takes people... Um, it, a lifeboat is when... The, they save people and take them back to land. So the people lowered the lifeboats, but they found out that the storm and the wind had damaged all the lifeboats to the point 
when there was only one lifeboat left. So um, luckily, the lifeboat was enough to fill all the crew and the captain. So everybody was loaded safely and um, they all squeezed inside until the captain was about to go inside a lifeboat. So he put the ladder down and he put, he, he put his foot on the first step when he noticed a cry coming from the deck of the ship. Um, the, the captain realized that there was a small boy running towards him. Um, th this, the boy had not trimmed his hair, his clothes were really ragged and he, it looked like he'd not eaten for a long time. Um, so the captain realized that this boy was a stowaway. Um, who knows what a stowaway is? Um, a stowaway is someone who who sneaks onto a vessel and does not pay any fare. Um, so this stowaway w had been hidden in the deck and he had not told anybody and the captain should have been mad at the stowaway. It was his boat after all. Um, he should have been asking the stowaway for money but not thinking about how the boy survived for so long, he just um, realised that the boy would have had to drown in the ship. Instead, he told the boy to go inside the lifeboat. Um, who knows what that meant for the captain? It means the captain had to face death. It means he had to take the stowaway's place. But the captain did not think of all that. He just sent the stowaway down to the lifeboat. The, the stowaway did not ask a question either. He, <coughs> he just put uh, his step over the ladder and went down. When they had all safely gotten inside the lifeboat, um, the crew started the lifeboat and they sailed away. The captain was left behind on a ship to certain death. Um, a few days later, the lifeboat was picked up by another ship and they all safely sailed away to land. The captain, however, sailed to his war tree grave. Um, the stowaway never forgot the captain's sacrifice. The captain was very brave. The, the stowaway always said, um about talk to others about the captain he kept a picture of the captain in his pocket he told um he took the picture out and he always pointed to it and said um he gave his life for me um we too jesus was just like the captain we are like the stories we do not deserve a place in his home but he came and died for us um we he is the captain and we are the stories we do not deserve a place in heaven it also um reminds us to be grateful um for what the for what jesus has done for us we can also say um he gave this place for us thank you
Praise Lord, hallelujah. Amen. Such a privilege to be here this morning. Uh, I was driving this morning from London and it was a hectic journey, but God was gracious. God, God showed mercy and grace and that I could be here this morning. Thank you. So I think uh, when, I was, when I was a child or in a children's story or in a vocational Bible school, there's one particular story that usually comes across. Uh, the teacher usually put their fist very tight. Is that right? And they say, here is the temple. Yes? Here is the steeple. Open the gate. Where are the people? Yes. Have you heard the story before? Yes, yes, yes. No. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to start with first with no people. I'm coming to that stage, such a second stage too. So first you put your fist very tight. Yes. Make sure your 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 thumb is that way. They ask the question. Here is the temple. Yeah. Here is the steeple. Okay. Open the door. Where are the people? There's no people inside. But the same way, you do the other way around. Okay? Here is the temple. Here is the steeple. Open the door. There are the people. Did you get it? Did you get that? Just doing it differently, you'll find people. So church, what we see today, it may be a, a, just a building, but what makes a difference is the people inside the church. So last week, this place was bustling, is that right? There's a lot of people. And uh, we had to open all the other facilities to make sure that everybody is comfortable and so the service can run. When people are reduced, you don't find many people inside. There's no more bustling, is that right? We are now trying to find out where are the musicians? <coughs> and where are the people who can operate many things in here are not around. And you find the service is running kind of not the same way it used to be last week, is that right? How many of you feel that way? Yeah. <laughs> There's one nod there. I think most of you are happy looks like that. Yes. <laughs> but what makes a difference is the people. people inside the temple make a lot of difference. If people inside the temple are not there, if they are empty inside, it's no point. It becomes very dull, very unhappy, not joyful, not happy occasion. Is that right? There is, a, there is this temple uh, or the church, I should say, on the way from Chesterfield to Sheffield, if you drive. There is this church the steeple is not the straight, it's wonky. Okay? It's, it's not the straight, it is, it is wonky. And if you, if, you, if you happen to see that, it's quite interesting, uh, a, a church, if you, if, you, if you come across it. Yes, so last week, this church was organized. But I'm not sure what difference from last week to this week is exactly the same week. The same Sabbath, and we all are here. What is that that made us last week to this week? Is anything different? Oh, we all are wearing nice clothes. Is that what it is? Or something, or different food? It's the same church. It's exactly the same. But how we operate is what changed. But what can we change is what makes a difference. Today, it's sermon entitled, The Church of Love. Or you could also call it, Church of Hearts. Church of Love, or Church of <coughs> Hearts. Talking about the heart. Okay, you see that in the, in, in the picture. There is these two theories that the theologians do present. Theologians present two different theories about this church. We'll go to the next slide. Oh, sorry, trying to. It works. So theologians present two theories, and this one particular theory is this: the church is a field. So church is located in a field. I'm talking about what field is not that wilderness we're talking about. It's talking about a field, a place where the church is located. Where we all come under and assemble 
promptly, sincerely, and worship God when on a Sabbath day. Is that right? On a seventh day, we come, we give everything what we can on this particular day, and we worship. So church is acts as a field for us to come together and enjoy the Sabbath school, enjoy the divine service, enjoy the praise and worship, enjoy the fellowship, enjoy the Bible study, and everything else happens inside, and this becomes a field where we all come together. How many of you look forward for a wonderful Sabbath program? How many of you look forward for a wonderful Sabbath program? Many of us, is that right? Many of us come gather together and sometimes we look forward for a Sabbath day so that we can enjoy of being in this field so that we can worship the Lord and give honor and glory to Him. We give praise to Him and when we leave this place, we go, what a wonderful Sabbath I had. I had many individuals uh, texted me last week and I'm very grateful uh, for the way that the service was led and I thank God for, for His mercy and grace. But that is what we look forward for. A wonderful Sabbath. Wonderful Sabbath in a church. The second theory goes like this. The church is a force. The individuals who come and assemble on a Sabbath day, when we leave through the door outside after the service, we all are represented of what? We are represented of what? We are representing this particular church. When we go, we go in a force and live a life for next six days and represent this church. This one particular assembly has now moves outside as a force and shows to the world, to the different field, for how many days? For six. So you've got these two theories. One theory says we enjoy the worship and, and that's it. My job finishes here and I go out. And that's what my, my, my church is all about. The other theory talks about my church doesn't end there. My church continues even after I leave these doors. And that is what the second theory talks about. But whether which theory appeals to you or not, I'm not sure. But it is both so important that we understand the church also functions. And also at the same time, we also represent this church outside. Now we're going to ask the question, well, what is this church? What is that and I'm going to represent? The church of what? The church of? The, what is the title of the sermon? The church of love, is that right? So we're going to represent the church of love or the church of hearts. So heart, not the, not the blue heart or whatever, the red heart, the loving heart, whatever we represent, I'm not sure if that's what it is. So church is a field that we come together faithfully and sincerely and worship. Church is also a force that when we finish this service, when we leave this place of worship, we also represent this church, but make sure that we represent as a true church, a loving church. We're going to go back to the scriptures and understand what does that mean? What does that mean? When Jesus was also worshipping faithfully and sincerely in the synagogue, is that right? So the Bible tells that Christ visited synagogue. How often? Every Sabbath, the Bible says. Is that right? But there are also occasions that he also opened a church in the open space. Where he was sat in a, in a, in a little boat, tossing over the waves. He also preached in an open church. How many of you believe that? Have you read that one? Do we read that? So Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, Christ opens a beautiful technique or a model or a method of teaching the followers who followed him faithfully. Is that right? He sat on a little boat as, as, the, as Matthew chapter 13 opens up and says, On the same day Jesus went out to the house and sat by the sea. Another place it says a lake, but those days they say sea. And great multitude were gathered together. To him, so that he got into a boat and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. So this was this open church where Christ sat on this particular boat and ready to speak. And there this audience were present. And there this he used this beautiful method of teaching them in parables. Because the disciples also did not understand why are you Jesus talking of talking to these people in parables? Is that the question that was asked? It was asked when you come into the later part of the chapter, you will find the disciples asking Jesus, 
Why are you talking to these people in parables? But Jesus then explains, and I don't want to go in detail. I think we heard a uh, little one, Emily, read the scripture. And he says very clearly, he says, prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled, which says, hearing you will hear. And shall understand. I'm not sure how many of you hear, you are hearing, but not understanding. Is anybody here saying that I'm hearing you, brother, talking? I don't think so, I understand. And then he continues on to say, I am seeing you will see, but not perceive. What it is, you hear, but you do not understand. But I see you, but I do not perceive it. For the hearts of these people have grown dull. Their ears are hard of hearing. And their eyes, they are closed. Sometimes we are here, but we are also not here. We are here, but you are also not here. You all can see me, at the same time you also don't see me. Is that what it says? You all hear me, but you don't understand. So when you see this little church, the happy church where the people are, they are what it says? They are very dull. I didn't say it. Am I saying this? Where do we read it? We read in the scriptures. As, as Jesus is talking to the disciples and to the multitude, he goes on and he opens a beautiful parable. And that's what we're going to head to. Which is the parable of the wheat and the tares. The parable of the wheat and the tares. That's where I'm going to linger a little bit. And then I'm going to jump on to the next parable within that chapter. And then we will uh, see the conclusion part of it. The parable opens like this says, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who soweth what? Okay, very important element you all are missing. He soweth what? Good seed. Good seed, amen. He says, he soweth good seed. Why that is so important? Because when you come to the later part of the verses, you will understand why the good seed is so important. It says, uh, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed good seed in this field. Remember, the church is a, we also represent outside, which is also a, I hope you can re relate these two, two, two theories. The church is all a field. You could also relate the churches, when we leave this place, there is also a field that we go in. Okay. So the man he sowed a good seed. But while man slept, his enemy, what does he do? He came and sowed what? He came and sowed tears among the wheat and went his way. Now you see two things, one in here. One, the man is sowing good seed when? In the daytime. In the daytime. How do you know that? Because when the man is sleeping, the enemy comes and does it when? In the night. So when do you sleep? Not, you said, not the ones who sleep during the day. I'm not sure how many of you practice that. But if you practice it, it's not meaning to that particular one. He says, the man sowed a good seed. And when he was asleep, his enemy came and sowed tears. Now, the, the, the Bible or the, or the parable does not explain what happens before you sow the seed. Do you just go and sow the seed in the land? You loosen the soil, is that right? You prepare the ground, loosen the soil, then you pour water, and then when it is ready, you pour the, so you, you sow the seed. But here the parable does not explain any of these, and it says very clearly, the kingdom of heaven is like, a kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed a good seed. That's how the parable starts. All this preparation, all this uh, planning and everything else, the parable does not address. It just goes on and to say, he is, he is throwing a good seed. But the enemy came along. But this is not my, my, my major part of the, 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 the lesson itself. It's coming later. It says, but when the grain was sprouted, how long does it take to sprout? Two weeks. Two to three weeks, three to four weeks, and a maximum of four weeks, you will see a seed sprouting, is that right? All those gardeners, you could all answer. 
But here you could see that, again, this, the parable does not go into detail to explain how long the owner, the man who sold a good seed, have to wait to see the seed sprouting. Is that right? Sometimes you will not see the result of our work until certain time. But here the man who sown the seed had waited for some time. The Bible is not very clearly explaining or the parable is not very explicitly mentioning it to us. But that does not mean that we ignore the waiting time. Okay. Now you see the sprout coming out. And then the question has been asked. So the servants of the owner, the man who sold the good seed, okay? The servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have pears? That's the question. Who is seeing it? My, 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 my boss, my, my, my owner, Sir, I, I, I saw you sowing good seed. I know you only do what? Good things. But I saw you doing it. But after two weeks, I see what? Days are also coming along. How that could have been happened? But until now, they do not know what had happened in the night. Is that right? Because you will not know the results of it until certain time period. Sometimes we expect things to happen straight away. Is that right? When I do things, what happens? I want the results straight away. And the results should be good. How many of you expect all your results to be good? Yeah. Sometimes we do not know the enemy works. He works and he throws his, his toys out of his pram and makes sure that you don't get wheat. What does he do? He makes sure that you also not have the good time, but rather you also experience some bad things. But here in this particular story, in this particular parable, where you see the enemy has sown, but that's not my lesson. I'm still coming to it. It says, it says, the owner came and said to him, Sir, so they came to the owner and said to him, Sir, do you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tears? He said to them, an enemy has done this. The servants said to him, do you want us then to go and gather them up? What's asking? The servants are now asking who? The servants are asking the owner, I know you, sir, you sow good seed, but we see tears. Can we now go and take the tears off? And how many of the gardeners here who do that? If you see a weed growing among your vegetables, do you not take away your, 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 your weeds out? Yes. How many of all the gardeners? That's exactly what these, these, these servants are asking the owner. Owner, we were seeing the tears among the weeds. Can we go and take them off? As, as gardeners, as you all mentioned, that's what you would do. But here... But here, you would see an answer. What does the master say? What does the master say? But he said to them, No! Don't go and take the tears out. Why? He says, No, don't take it out. While you gather up the tears, you also uproot the wheat with them. So what does that tell you? So you think that these individuals do not know how to take the tears off? They might be as a good farmer, but here in this parable is very clear to explaining to us, I am not sending you to go and take the test because you might also take the, the wheat, which is good ones. So he is not giving you the task of harvesting or not task of taking or sorting it out. He is not giving you the chance to go and take it out. Why? Because... We do not know how to do it. Because you do not know how to do it. Because you do not know how to do it. He said, you don't know how to do it. Because you may take some good ones out. And it goes on to say, let them both grow together. Here farmers tell me, do you let your wheat and your vegetables grow together? No. No. Do you leave it to grow together? But here the owner, here the man who sown a good seed, he is telling them, no, no, don't take the tears off. Let them go together. Let them go together. Because if I send you out to take the tears off, you will also take the good ones. Remember, this one sheep was lost. Is that right? The story tells. What does the story tell? He went for that one. 
But here, he does, the owner does not want to take a chance of losing what? One good wheat. He wants to make sure that every single one of them need to be saved. It doesn't matter even if it grows among the tares. Even if it grows among the tares, let it grow. Because I'm not going to give you the task of sorting it out. I'm not going to give you a task of removing the tares. Because you might remove the good ones. You might remove the good ones. But before I go on to explain what does that mean, I wanted to just jump on to the another parable which also talks about exactly the same. Parable of the or, or the net or the fish or the dragnet. I'm going to skip this Christ object lesson. I'm just going to come to that one in a minute. Okay, this is uh, 47. Okay, once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net. Now, before what? It was a land, so it was a field. Is that right? Now it was a, is now is happening now in the sea. He says, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught what? All kinds of fish. By the way, this is new international version. Okay, so that to understand it better, so I put them through. Okay, it says, it down into the lake, uh, lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. They said, sat down, they, they, they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets. And threw what? And threw the bad away. This is how it will be at the end of the when it will happen? This will happen when? End of the age. What happens at the end of the age? The good ones will be taken and the bad ones will be put away. Put into fire which will come into the parable later. You will find what happens to the taste. It is thrown into fire. So you will see two kinds of things happening but it is not given in your hands to do it by because it is the job of who? When you come into the same uh, book of Matthew chapter 13 verse 37, it says, He who sown the seed, or we who sown the good seed, is who? He is the son of man. The field is where? The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is in the, when? Is end of the? End of the world, end of the age. So it very clearly says, when my Christ comes back again, there is going to be a sorting out. That sorting out is going to be for the good and for the bad. So the job is not given to you to do anything else. It is the job of who? Christ. The sorting it out, or making sure that the good seeds are put away, the weeds or the bad fish are put away separately, because it is not our job. It is the job of who? Sometimes we take this job diligently. Sometimes we take this job diligently, is that right? Everybody is nodding or not, I don't know. Yes. We take this job diligently, but whose job it is? God. Whose job it is? God. It is Christ Jesus' job, but sometimes we take it with pleasure. We take it with pleasure, making sure that I'm sorting out that person is a weed. That person is a tear. That person is a bad fish. We, we, we take the point. We take it on board. But not knowing, it is not the job of ours. It is the job of who? It is job of the, it is job of Christ. We are taking His job. Now this is what it says in here. Christ object lesson, pen of inspiration. Ellen White writes in chapter four, and she says, "Christ servants are grieved as they see true and false believers mingled in where? Believers mingled in where? In the church." Not my writing, you can go and read that one in Christ's object lesson in chapter 4. And she's meaning what? The church. And she's saying it here, they long to do something to cleanse the church. Sometimes we take it in our hand, thinking we are cleansing the church by putting the weed and the bad fish away. Did you see what I'm saying here? Sometimes we take it in our hand. It says, we take it in our hand, thinking we are cleansing the church. Thinking we are doing things good. But here it says, I don't want you to take the tears out. I want it to grow. I want it to grow. Because it is not your job. Wait until the end of the ages. I will do the job. I will do the job. So don't take it in your hand. And that's what it says here. Like the servants of the householder, they are ready to uproot the tears. 
Sometimes we take this with pleasure of uprooting pears, thinking they are bad, thinking they are bad fish. But Christ says to them, Nay, lest while you gather up the tares, you root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest or until the end of the age. So my brothers and sisters, it is not our job. It is not our role. It is not our position to do of sorting or taking the tares out or taking the bad fish out. It is the job of who? Of Christ Jesus. Now continuing on Christ's object lesson. I think uh, there's one, one more, one more place. Christ's object lesson. Uh, where is that? Aha, uh -huh, missed it. <coughs> Sorry, I think I missed another another portion. Where, where, where Ellen White very, very powerfully, power, powerfully talks about it, making sure that we understand that that don't even go there. Don't even go there of thinking of doing or putting things away. Because it is not our role to do it. So what does then Christ do it? And how does Christ do it? But before we go there, but I just wanted to warn us that, that the James chapter 4 verse 11 to 12, he talks about brothers and sisters, do not slander who? Do not slander one another. Anyone who speaks against a brother or a sister or judges them speaks against the who? Against law. Against the law and judges, when you judge the law, you are not keeping it, but sitting in judgment on it. And then it goes on further, it says, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? It is very clear, explicitly clear. Don't take the job of Christ in your hands. Sometimes it is so easy for us to pass remark and he says, do not slander. Do not slander one another. It could, be, it could be a small one. It could be an older one. It could be anybody else. But it is not our job to slander anybody. Today, if you are building what we call a church of love, church of heart, it is so clear that we understand that we do not slander one another, but rather we stay together and go together. It is the job of my Christ Jesus. When he comes, he will do it. Removing the tares, removing the good wheat, or removing the good fish, and removing the bad fish. It is not my road to do it. Going on further, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For we all, that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each of us may receive what is due us for the things done while in the body, whether it is good or bad. So, Today it, 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 it might come not as a surprise to many, but we do it knowingly or unknowingly. Is that right? We, this is not something new. Is that right? Is anybody thinks this is new? That this parable that you've not read it before? We all read this one several times before, but we do it. It comes as a habit, not realizing that it is wrong. How many of you think? How many of you can allow, if I come into your house and do the job of yours, anybody will allow me to do it? Can I, can I make a decision in your house? Can I take a role of doing things in your house? You won't do it, is that right? If you don't allow anybody else to come into your house to do the job, what you are doing it, or the role that you perform, how can you then take the, the, the job of Christ in your hand? We take it easily in our hand. But the, the, the Bible is very clear. As we read in James chapter 4 verse 11. Brothers and sisters, do not. It says do not slander. And it goes on further. How does then Jesus do? Jesus do it differently. And he, do, and, 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 and he does it well. I put it in, the, in this triangle. Not necessarily a triangle. For me to remember the way how it is. So that we can also, I can also pass it on. The three particular words that Christ do it so well. One, he does love. He accepts it. And he forgives it. You cannot do one or the other. You cannot, you cannot forgive somebody and don't love. Can anybody do that one? Brother, I forgive you, but I don't love you. Brother, I love you so much. I love you so much, but I don't accept who you are. Okay, I don't, I don't, I don't forgive you, but I love you. Otherwise, 
Or we, we come and say that, brother, I accept you, but I don't love you, not forgive you. I accept you. There is, there is nothing like that. There is, no, there is no one or the other. But Christ does it so beautifully, combining all these three. He, he does love, he accepts who you are, and then he also forgives. Or you can also say, he forgives you because he loves you. And then he accepts you as his own child. My brother, my, my children, is that right? So it is, it is not one or the other. It is a combination of all that needs to be in place if you have to be like who? By like Christ. Even then you can't take the judgment in your hand until it is covered in his skin. Even then, even then you can't take it. But, but Christ is very clearly saying you cannot have one or the other. You need to have all these three combined together. All combined together. Jesus loved, accepted, and he also forgave. Is that right? If you think about Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus was a tax collector, but none of the none of the civil, none of the uh, residents of that particular place liked him. None of them loved him. But Christ comes along and he says, Zacchaeus, come down. I want to be in your house. I want to have a dinner with you. He comes along, he accepts him, he loves him, and he forgives. He forgives. I do not know how many of us would be able to do something like that. The woman at the well, or the prostitute woman. Okay? Okay, so you also find Judas. I still love him, is that right? It was him who take, he took the decision. But Christ did love him. Peter would deny Christ how many times? Three times. But Christ still loved him, accepted him, and also he forgave his mistakes. The thief on the cross, whatever he did, but when he gave himself to Christ, he gave completely. But Christ recognized that. If you and me were in that position, will we would have accepted the thief on the cross. We would have passed judgment on him. Is that right? We would have passed. So it could be many stories of this kind. But Christ shown a different principle. A different example. So that we can follow it. Not just one or the other. But rather all of it. That you love. You accept. And you forgive. You love. You accept. You forgive. So whether it is going to be a tear. Or whether it is a bad wish. I do not know. Christ knows who we are. I could be probably saying it in here, but in your eyes, I may be a tear. I may be a bad, a bad, bad, bad fish. Is that right? Or in your eyes, some people might be a bad fish. When I said bad fish, I mean a very, very big bad fish. Or a tear. We do not know. But in front of God's eyes, what is it? You all are precious. Is that right? We all are precious. Until he comes and he judges. When? The end of the ages. I'm not saying the Bible is very clearly saying. Until the end of the age, you and me do not know who you are. Whether you are a tear or you are a bad fish. Because Christ is the judge and he is the only one who can decide and make it happen. So today is our chance to love, accept and forgive. forgive. In order to keep what? In order to have what? In order to have what? The church of <coughs> church of love. Thank you, brothers. At least one 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 is uh, able to voice it out. In order for us to have a church of love, we need to have what? We need to love, accept and forgive. Love, accept and forgive. At least you remember these three words before you go. Yes, more than enough for us. In order for us to function and be a church of love, what we should do? We should love. Accept or forgive. Whichever way you do it, I do not worry. Whether you forgive somebody and then you love and then you accept them. Or you accept them because you love them and then you forgive. Or you do the other way around. You forgive them, you accept them and you love them. Whichever way you do it, I do not mind. The Bible does not say it very clearly. But he says, but do it. Because why? Christ, that's how he does it. That's how he does it. Moving on. Oh, this is where the guys of the lesson. Sorry. I didn't realize where I put it there. He says, Christ has plainly taught that those who perish in open sin must be separated from the church. What does he say? Somebody who does what? Open sin should be what? 
must be separated from the church, but he has not committed to us the work of judging character and he has not given what? He has not given the judging what? Character and motive. He has not given to you and to me. This is Ellen White writing this one for the churches. Isn't that powerful to understand it? She's telling you cannot judge. You cannot be committed to us the work of judging character and motive. And, 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 and motive. Sorry, I think my that's connected to the So and then it continues on and, and, and to say, he knows our nature too well. What does it say? He knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. So he says, I do not trust you so much that you and you go and uproot a weed or uproot a tear, you might also take the good one. So I am not going to give you the job. And it continues on to say, he knows our nature too well to entrust this work to us. Should we try to uproot from the church those whom we suppose to be spurious Christians, we should be sure to make mistakes. Often we regard as hopeless subjects. Sometimes we regard other people as what? I am not saying these are not my words. These are not my words. This is pen of inspiration writing to us. And very clearly talks about what? The church. Sometimes we talk about they are hopeless. They are hopeless subject. Sometimes we consider one another. As James talked about in chapter 4, once we slander one another, he said, no, as a hopeless subjects. Can you see that? Ellen White writing this one and saying, oh wow. See, uh, we have to think about it. When we talk about somebody else, what it is, we are considering them to be hopeless. That's why we are talking about it. And here he's pointing at it very clearly. He says, hopeless subject, the very ones whom Christ is drawing to himself. The ones you call, the ones you call others as a hopeless, what Christ is doing? Christ is drawing them to him. And you call them hopeless. Christ is what? Christ is drawing to him. But you and me call him what? Hopeless. How can we do that? Christ is, Christ is loving you. He is also loving that person. Christ died on the cross. Not only for you and for me. He also died for them. But we call them hopeless, but Christ is drawing them to him. If you and me are the children of God, they are also children of God. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, not only for the good, he also gave it for the bad. So that they will have a chance to repent like the thief on the cross, like the Zacchaeus on the sycamore tree, like the woman at the well, like the prostitute that, 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 that met Christ. It could be you and me in the situation. But allowing Christ to function in our hearts so that we can be accepted, we can be loved, we can be forgiven. But give a chance for Christ to do his work. Don't take it in our hands. And that's, that's, that's what he's it, talking about. I think when you got time, just go and read chapter 4 relating to this particular chapter. Ellen White powerfully writes for the church so that we understand the importance of being in the church and being in church to love one another. Love one another. I'm going to go back and again. I'm just going to go back and again just read Christ's love. What is Christ's love like? Psalm chapter 103 verse 11 and 12 says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him. Those who fear him, as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgression from us. My brothers and sisters, Christ is, Christ's love is so much that he is able to remove all our sins. However big it is, however long it is, doesn't matter. But Christ is willing to wash that away. Put it away. So there is nobody should be called what? Nobody should be called hope. Hopeless. Nobody should be called hopeless because my Christ is loving them as well. But nobody is come under the badge of hopelessness because my Christ has also died for them. 
and goes on to say further in, in, in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 10 says, For the mountains shall depart and the hills be removed, but my kindness shall not depart from you. Nor shall my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has mercy on you and me. Is that right? Because Christ has shown mercy, who are we to show not mercy? Who are we to not to show that grace? Who are we to be bad to those individuals? Who are we to not to be like Christ? When Christ is drawing them, we are putting away. What is it? Christ is drawing them and we are badging them what? Hopeless. That's Christ's love. Not to understand Christ's love, it is immeasurable. You and me cannot measure it. But that is how Christ's love is. Whether we are going to be like Christ, but we need to understand that Christ came for all. Christ accepts. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 8 to 9, he says, Finally, all of you be of what? Different mind. All of you of different mind. So we all will function differently. Is that right? We all function differently or we all function as one? We all function as one. How many of you believe that we all function as one? You all believe we all function as one? But I'm not saying it. That's what Bible is saying it. What he's saying is, finally all of you be of one mind. Having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tender hearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil. Even if somebody else does evil, what you should do? You should do? He says, don't turn evil for evil, reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you are called to call to this, that you may inherit what? A blessing. In order for you to inherit a blessing, even if somebody else does evil, you do good. Even if somebody else thinks bad for you, you think good for them. And he says, one mind. It's very, very important. We have to be what? In one mind, not in different minds. Think about uh, if you are, I'm not sure, I'm not uh, an experience of riding the uh, uh, bullock cart with the, with the, with the two, two cows, or it could be a horses. If both pulls in different direction, what will happen? Who will be on the floor? The person who's riding will be on the floor. Is that right? Sometimes, if we are of one mind, we will be together. Is that right? Sometimes they, they put the horses, the, the, the cover to their eyes, so that it doesn't look at anywhere else. Sometimes our temptation, what happens? Sometimes our temptation, what happens? We divert our attention. Because of our diversion in our attention, we tend to go away. It won't be in one mind. Look at one horse looking at something else here, very fascinating, and moves to this side. The other horse on this side looks on the other side, looks very fascinating, and both pull the wrong direction. My brothers and sisters, this is not me who explained, this is from the scripture saying, finally, this finally, all of you. He says, all of you be of one mind. He does not tell part of you be of one mind, part of you be on the different mind. All of us should be in one mind. That's how uh, Peter writes it. In, in, in Hebrews chapter 10 verse 24 and 25, it reads says, And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and not the other around. <laughs> what is it? The word is a beautiful word, isn't it? Don't stir up. <laughs> a lot of things are being stirred up, is that right? He says, but stir up for what? For doing good works. For love. Stir up the good works. Stir up the love among us. Don't stir up anything wrong because it gives wrong. I know it's, it, it's a recording of what I've given us another example, but that's okay. We'll go on further. It says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day is approaching. My brother and sisters, it is not too long. To go, that Christ is going to come. Is that right? It's not too long to go that Christ is going to come. Is that right? How many of you believe that? How many of you believe? You all believe that Christ is going to come. If Christ is going to come, it is not too long, my brothers and sisters, for us to be in one mind so that we stir up good works. 
we shut up love from one another because when Christ comes, he is going to separate the tares and the wheat, he is going to separate the good fish and the bad fish. We want to make sure that we fall in which side? On the good side, not on the bad side. If you're going to fall on the good side, you're going to inherit what? Kingdom of heaven, as the Bible records. If you're going to be on the wrong side, you're going to be thrown where? In the fire. I'm not the parable talks about you will be thrown into the fire. That's what the parable very clearly talks about in, in the Matthew chapter 13 verse 30 says, Let both go together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First, gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. If you and me are sincere, if you and me are uh, loving, kind, merciful to one another, not slandering, but rather stirring up the good works, we will be in the barn, the place that Christ is preparing for you and for me. If you and me are found not faithful, we will be thrown into the fire. Now we talked about the love, we talked about the accept. The last two ones is about Christ forgives. Christ forgives it so well that you and me struggle to do it. He says in Colossians chapter 3 verse 30, he says, bear with each other. Sometimes we don't bear it at all. How many of you have patience to bear with one another? We talk quickly, is that right? We react quickly. We, we, we do things very quickly. It says, bear with one another or bear with each other. Forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord. Sometimes we forget the Lord forgives us. Sometimes we forget the Lord forgives us. We tend to not forgive other people thinking and not realizing somebody else is forgiving. How selfish we could be that we are receiving the benefit from one side and not doing it to the other. We are receiving the forgiveness from God but not able to forgive the other people. You see that? Bear with each other. Today we need to learn to bear with one another. Today you will need to understand one another. We need to be in that one mind. We have to stir up the good works. We have to stir up the love so that we could bear one another. Sometimes I say, oh, I cannot tolerate that brother. I cannot tolerate that sister. I cannot be in that group. There is nothing like that in here. He said, we said, bear with each other. You've got to bear it. Christ bore. He, he bore our sins. Is that right? He died on the cross. How, how long he is he's able to forgive you and me? How he is able to tolerate you and me? Even though we are not sincere to him, he is forgiving us. Is that right? He is bearing us. That's why he says, bear with each other. I think this is my last verse, I think. Christ forgives. Luke chapter 6, verse 37 says, Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. My brothers, these verses, these verses are quite strong. You have to observe these verses into our thinking. We have to observe these into our hearts. We need to meditate some of these verses. It is just not comes as a flash and leaves. Today, my brothers, the cry is that we need to be a church of love. We need to be a church of love. In order for us to be a church of love, we need to be like <laughs> Jesus. <coughs> Let's not take the job of who? Let's not take the job of who? Christ. Let's not take the job of Christ. All he's asking us to do is what? Love. Accept and forgive. if you love, accept and forgive, we are, we are working the way how Christ worked. It is his role, he will do his part whether you are a tear or a wheat, whether you are a good fish or a bad fish. Not now, when he comes second time. My prayer and our prayer should be that we will be found in the good place. So when he comes, if we are living, we will be meeting him in the air. If you and me are not living, if we are passed away, not living on this earth, you will be called by your name. We have to hope and have that faith that God is going to call me or I will be meeting him in the air. If you want to be in that group, not in the group where you're going to be put into fire, if you want to be in the group to go to heaven, if you want to go and inherit the place that Christ is preparing for you and for me, if you want to go and see the God the Father, if you want to go and be amongst 
the holy and saints who are dwelling in heaven. If you want to be in that group, if you want to be in that part, make sure that you follow, that you love, you accept, and you forgive. Do not be in the group where we will be thrown into fire. If you and me are going to be thrown in the fire, you and me have lost the opportunity that many people do not have the opportunity. Is that right? You and me have the opportunity of the scriptures. Many people do not have the opportunity. Let us be the church of the church by force that we are able to go and represent Christ in our life so that we can also bring many more souls for him. This is my prayer this morning. Amen. Thank you, Brother Alvin, for the inspiring message. Let's all learn to love each other, accept and forgive as Christ has taught us the same. For our closing song, let's all rise up and sing hymn number 449. Hymn number 449, Never Part Again.
Father God, we do not want to part you, but we want to stay closer to you. We wanted to do what you have done on this earth, to love, to accept, and to forgive. Father God, thank you for enlightening us through your word. We pray that we not leave these words in here and go away, but rather we carry it. Let us be the <coughs> church who goes by force and makes sure that the field is tamed, that we're able to sow the seed, not for us to judge, but for you to take control of your own. Father God, we pray that you will keep us safe into the hands. We pray that you will help us to be faithful, to be sincere to you and to you only. Let us not rather let us not slander, but rather we show love to one another. Let us stir the good works amongst us. Let us be a church, a church of love, church of hearts, so that we're able to enjoy the fellowship of you amongst us. We submit and surrender ourselves into the hand and care and keeping, Lord. We pray that you will take our life into your control. And we pray that when you come second time, that we're able to find ourselves in a in, in, in the good land or the good wheat or a good fish. So we'll be able to go and inherit the place that you're preparing for you and for, 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 for us. Especially uh, that, 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 that we come together and accept who you are and what you have done for us. Once again, Father, we submit ourselves into the hand. We pray that you'll forgive our sins and accept us as we are. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Six, nine, one.